Okay, so welcome to the second half of the Schubert seminar with uh, Dapping Wang telling us about the uh, cluster structures for Legendian links. Please take it away. Dapping. Yeah, thanks. Um, so now uh, we moved on to the more technical part of uh, the talk. Uh, so first, uh, cluster structures. Um, right, so it's a bit hard to, to give precise definition of cluster structures in a, in a seminar talk. And normally you require more than half of the seminar to do it. Uh, so I'm going to follow the tradition of not giving the, the precise definition, but giving you the rough idea of what the cluster structure is. So a cluster variety, roughly speaking, is an affine variety via an atlas of torus charts. Right? So this is very analogous to how we think about manif smooth manifolds. Right? So a manifold is a topological space with an atlas of charts that are diffeomorphic to Rn. Uh, a cluster variety is an F5 variety with an atlas of charts, and each of them is isomorphic to a torus, to an algebraic torus. So, torus charts are isomorphic, to C star to the n for some n. And moreover, we require that each chart is equipped with a quiver and a collection of local coordinates. So local coordinates are also known as cluster variables. You may have heard of these names, but cluster variables are local coordinates. And local coordinates in the sense that uh, this C star to the N is regarded as the spec of, of this uh, C join X1 plus minus dot dot, dot Xn plus minus. So, so the so the, the, the coordinate ring of a, an algebraic torus is a Laurent polynomial ring, and these generators are the local coordinates. These are the, the cluster variables. Moreover, uh, we also require that the gluing map of these torus charts are governed, by, are governed recursively by a combinatorial process called mutation. So under mutation, require both uh, data of a chart to, to change. Right? So you have one chart, so you have one chart here and another chart here, right? So the quiver of one chart has to undergo a quiver mutation to get to the quiver of the next chart. And the cluster variables of one chart has to go uh, undergo cluster mutation to get to coordinates of the next chart. So there's a combinatorial process called mutation. So in some senses, I mean, in, in a way, it sounds very restrictive, right? It's, it's hard to imagine that this kind of uh, definition is ever going to be interesting. But it turns out that this actually exists in a very wide uh, range of uh, mathematics. Uh, many spaces are known to be cluster, uh, Grassmannian, black varieties, uh, bus Samuelson varieties, and so on. And uh, if you... Uh, algebraic uh, ge geometer, you're probably going to point out uh, my mistake. These are not affine varieties. They are, they are projective varieties, what you're talking about. Uh, well, I, I should mention that in order to get a, get a cluster variety, you have to toss out something. You always have to delete uh, some divisor in order to get a, a cluster variety. So, so the real cluster variety is going to be Grassmannian, uh, throw away a divisor, that variety throw away some devices and and bus variety throw away some devices. So so the remaining part is 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 an affine variety. Okay. Um, yeah, and let me also mention that uh, cluster structures actually uh, is very closely uh, related to to toric geometry as well. Um, you should really regard a cluster variety as uh, a, a, a deformed version of the torus inside a toric variety. So in a toric variety, there's only one torus in the middle, uh, and the toric variety is often described by uh, some sort of fan structure, and each, each chamber in the fan is going to tell you uh, some coordinates on the torus, but the good news is that when you go to the next chamber, it's still going to be the same torus, but just rotate it a little bit, right? So, so that the the corner change is a monomial change. It in the cluster uh, variety, uh, when you go to the next chamber, 
the tor is actually not just rotated a little bit, but goes a bit sideways so that uh, the the mod, the change of coordinates is no longer monomial. It's going to be a binomial change coordinate. And that's what gives rise to this kind of source charts overlapping together. So, uh, so there's, there's, there's a whole parallel between uh, cluster structures and, and toric variety. And uh, whenever you see a, a statement uh, in cluster variety, cluster structures, uh, you probably want to think about what counterpart, what what's the counterpart counter uh, statement in in the toric setting, and that's that usually will give you a very good idea of what what the type cluster structure is talking about. Okay, um, so that's a very general overview of what a cluster structure is. Let me state the main theorem. So the main theorem uh, of today's talk uh, is that for many positive ray betas, uh, the flag moduli space M beta is a cluster variety. And moreover, some exact Lagrangian fillings of this minus one closure naturally induces induce uh, cluster charts in, in this flag moduli space. And if two exact Lagrangian fillings are Hamiltonian isotopic, then they must induce the same uh, cluster chart. So in this sense, the cluster structure is giving you a very effective way of comparing, uh, of distinguishing uh, exact Lagrangian fillings. Uh, if you if you can show that the two fillings give you two different cluster charts, then they cannot be Hamiltonian isotopic. Okay. Um, so here, uh, the language is not very precise. So let me also say what I mean by for many betas. Uh, so in the book, uh, in my joint work with uh, Hong Hao Ga and Lin Hui Shen, uh, we look at rainbow closures in this case. So all rainbow closures, uh, this, this, this statement is true for all rainbow closures. So uh, I mentioned during the break, a, rain, a rainbow closure, the, the closure looks like this, and they are all uh, instances of minus one closures. Uh, on the other hand, in this later joint work with uh, Matrika South, we look at uh, something more general than rainbow closures. Right? So we look at some minus one closures. Uh, some minus one closures that are related to what we call uh, uh, grid paper graphs. Closures related to grid paper graphs. But uh, I, the, the, but later on, uh, there's a joint book by uh, Purcell, uh, Gorski, Gorski, uh, Lin Hui Shen, or oh, uh, Ian Lei, Lin Hui Shen, uh, and then Jose Simantao. Uh, they proved it uh, for all minus one closures uh, of the form gamma w naught where the delta zoo product of gamma is also W0. So, so they, they, further, they further, they prove a more general result than, than what, I, what I had with uh, my collaborators. So this is the most general uh, up to date. So now we know that all minus one closures of the form uh, gamma W0 with gamma itself, having a delta zoo product W0, have, all have this uh, phenomenon. Okay, and how does this, how would this help us solve the, the infinite many filling conjecture? Well, let me also mention that uh, cluster structures are much uh, better, con we have much better control than, 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 than exact Lagrangian fillings. Uh, and the reason is that at the beginning of, of uh, cluster theory, uh, Fulman Zarinsky already gave a finite type classification of cluster varieties. So cluster varieties, with finally many cluster charts are called a uh, finite type. And like anything finite type in algebra, they are classified by thinking diagrams. So other than a few, uh, uh, two infinite family basically, and, 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 uh, and, the, and some sporadic ones, uh, or everything else is infinite type. 
All right, any question about this main theorem? So part three is a bit, uh, a bit quick. Uh, if there's any question about what's the theory in general, I'm happy to answer. If not, uh, I'm gonna move on to the filling cluster correspondence. So maybe I'll just ask a quick question, just yes. a really basic example. Um, if you just had beta as say one two, then you mm -hmm. just, just get a point in the in the moduli space. What do you get as a moduli space in this case? Well, it's going to be very stacky, right? If just if it's just one two, I guess you're you're talking about three strand braid. Yeah, sorry, and I'm thinking exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be very stacky. Uh, it's it's a point quotient by some group. I see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So so in general, uh, the the interesting cluster case is for longer braids. Yes, but but this this is uh, also interesting in 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 some other way. Right. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So now let, let's talk about the filling cluster correspondence. Okay. So let's look at this uh, positive braid one two one one two one one two one. Uh, it's basically w naught third time, uh, third power. Uh, so what if I want to write it, write down the the chain of flex? It's going to satisfy this relative position. So it's going to be one two one one two one and so on. But instead of writing it this way, let me actually uh, use some colored edges to to separate the flex, oops. So I'm gonna use blue for one and red for two. So I can do one, two, one, one, two, one, and then one, two, one, and have twos here. Okay. So this will carry the same the same data. Instead of having a, a, a dash with a labeling, I'm gonna just use edges to separate the flex. But then this looks like this is asking us to 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 draw the edges further into the disk to fill in the disk. So this is this leads us to what's called a Lagrangian n weave. So a Lagrangian n weave is a planar graph with edges colored by one, two, all the way to n minus one. So n corresponds to n minus one here. Uh, I should think of this as the Cox the generators and special kinds of vertices. So there are three kinds of vertices that we allow. Uh, there's a monochromatic trivalent vertex. Right? So it, as it sounds, right, it's a trivalent vertex, the same color edges. And then there's a hexavalent vertex with adjacent colors. So for example, if red means two and blue means one, right? so I can have a hexavalent vertex like this with adjacent colors, or you could have a tetravalent vertex, tetra means four, with far away colors. For example, uh, I can use this as one and this as three. So far away means that the late, the, the Cox generators are not next to each other. It's, it's more, more than one apart. Okay. So I allow these three kinds of, of vertices. And let me point out that the last two kinds of vertices, it's a resemblance of, of uh, the Bray relation. So this is kind of like S1, S2, S1, and it equals S2, S1, S2, right? So you see one to one on this side and two one two on this side. And this is resembling S1, S3 equals S3, S1. So these two are a uh, resemblance of, of uh, the Bray relations. And then the first one has something to do with uh, the Damazu product. Okay, so it's like S1 squared equals S1. So this is the Damazu product. Okay. So we allow these vertices. So let's do a practice and, and try to fill in this picture here. I, I could do a hexavalent change here and the hexavalent change here. Okay. 
I, then I can join this and then I can do another hexavalent change here and join this and then I have a trivalent vertex in the middle. Right? So for example, right, this will be a Legendian N weave, a three weave. So you see that the all the all the vertices are the, the types that we mentioned. Any question about this example? All right. Um, so now, uh, mimicking how we define the flag modulus space of for passive braid uh, for a weave uh, W, I can also define a flag modulus space. Uh, Uh, MW to be so it's going to be uh, flex uh, satisfying relative position uh, imposed by W and then you quotient again by the GRN action. Right. What do I mean by flex satisfy the relative position imposed by W? Well, uh, if you look at this picture up here, you see that there are still some gaps in between. So for example, F9, F10, F11. So you need to fill in those regions and you have to fill it in the way such that uh, the flag satisfy the relative position imposed by the edges. So for example, F0 and F9 is separated by a red edge. That means that the two has to be uh, relative position two apart from each other. And F9 and F11 have to be of relative position one away from each other. So you have to, you, the flags have to satisfy these relative position conditions. And then you again cushion out by the GRN action. Okay, so this is the, modular, the flag modular space of a weave. Any question? Okay. So now, uh, not all weaves are useful to us. Um, so the, use, the ones that are useful are called free weaves. So let me give you a, a, uh, a practical definition of what a free weave is. It, this is not uh, the, the, the actual definition given by uh, Gasal and Zasso, but uh, it, it works equivalently the same. Okay, so weave is free if uh, the flag modularized space is an algebraic torus and the interior flags are uniquely determined by the boundary flags. <clears throat> okay. So when W is a free weave, then we can do a restriction map. We can take the modularized space for the weave and then gonna forget everything inside and just look at the boundary that gives you an open embedding of an algebraic torus, where beta is the boundary braid of W. Right? So you have, when you have a weave, you can go around the boundary of the weave and read off the part of the braid, and that, and the modular space, the flat modular space of of the weave is going to open inject in, open embed into the flat modular space of the part the boundary part of the braid, and this embedding is an embedding of a torus because if it's free, it is a algebraic torus. So, um, so you get you get a torus inside the the flat moduli space uh, M beta. Right? So we say in the in the main theorem that this is a cluster variety. Right? So in order to be a cluster variety, there should be torus charts, and this are the candidates of the torus charts. Okay. And, but on the other hand, this is called a filling cluster correspondence. Now we get the cluster, what about the fillings? How do you get exact Lagrangian fillings from weaves? Well, uh, it turns out that each weave actually describes an immersed surface in X1, X2, Z. So how? Well, you should think of a weave drawn on on the disk as telling you a generic uh, end-to-one coupling of the disk 
where uh, the edges are the singular locus. Right? So if you have, if you see an edge here, that means that the the two sheets, the two the the bottom sheet and the second to the bottom sheet cross each other, right? Versus if you see a red edge that tells you that the second and the third sheet cross each other along that edge. So along an edge, the sheets cross each other. Okay. So that's that's how you how you see an edge. What about vertices? Well, uh, for a trivalent vertex, there are actually two sheets crossing each other around that trivalent vertex. And one way to to think about it is, is by looking at the graph of the imaginary part of z to the three halves. So you can use a graphing calculator and graph this multivalue function. Generically, you're going to see two uh, points in the graph, but then these graphs actually cross each other along three lines, and that's what this surface is like. So this is trivalent vertex. What about a hexavalent vertex? So the hexavalent vertex, you will look at uh, the coordinate hyperplanes in R3, right? and if you put place yourself at the passive octant and look towards the origin, generically you're gonna see three points, but then the sheets cross each other along the coordinate axis. In particular, the top two sheets cross along the positive axis, and the bottom two sheets cross along the, the negative axis. So if you stand in the positive octant and look towards the origin, you're gonna see a local picture of these three sheets crossing each other. That's a hexavalent vertex. And what about a four-valent vertex? Well, four-valent vertex is not really uh, playing that much. It's like you have two sheets crossing in one direction and another two sheets crossing in a different direction and they are far apart. So they don't even talk to each other. And so that's what a four-valent vertex is like. So in this way, a weave is going to give you a merged surface in R3, where the z direction is the height direction. So the z is the height direction. OK. And there's a reason I use x1, x2, z rather than x, y, z. And that's because I'm going to do uh, what I did with the Legendrian link. right? So I'm going to get a Legendrian surface by taking a cotangent lift. So I'm going to set yi to be the partial derivatives of z with respect to xi. And this way, I'm going to, we're going to get a Legendrian surface in R5. And the projection of the Legendrian surface onto R4 gives an exact Lagrangian, field, Lagrangian surface. Okay. So this R4 is going to be symplectic. Right. And and the image, so by forgetting the z coordinate, the image in x1, x2, y1, y2 is going to be a, an exact Lagrangian surface if w is free. And moreover, this exact Lagrangian field surface is actually a filling of the minus one closure of its boundary braid. So it fills the braid. And um, and using this connection to exact Lagrangian fillings, we can actually view the algebraic torus, uh, that's the, the flat moduli space of the weave, uh, as the moduli space of rank one local systems on the exact Lagrangian surface. Right? So as we know, uh, local system, rank one local systems on the surface is going to be home uh, from H1 of the surface to C star, which is also uh, also H upper one of the surface with the with C star coefficient, which is the torus. All right. Um, now I have, oh, good. I'm doing good with time. 
Uh, any question? All right, so now we can uh, outline how to prove this infinite many filling conjecture with cluster theory. So there are two steps. One, we need to find a Lagrangian isotopy, right? So this isotopy can be constructed using the right Meister moves. And you want to prove that this isotopy induces a cluster automorphism on the flat moduli space. So a cluster automorphism is an automorphism on the variety such that it moves one chart onto another chart. Right? So, so any automorphism should preserve the structure that you're interested in. In this case, the cluster automorphism should preserve the cluster structure. So you should preserve the, the atlas of cluster charts, but then they permute the charts. It moves one chart to the other. And then you have to argue that the induced automorphism is of infinite order. Right? So it means that if you start with one chart, and then you move to another chart and move to another chart, and then we're going to come back to the same chart ever, ever again. So now, with this in place, what we can do is we can start with uh, the link lambda beta, take any filling that correspond to a cluster. And now, the Lagrangian isotopy can view it as a cylinder. You can view it as a cylinder acting on, on the link, because the isotopy just moves the, the link around. So it is a, a cylinder. And then you can attach this cylinder to this filling. But since this filling corresponds to a cluster already, and this is a cluster automorphism, so this new filling is going to give you another cluster that's different from the first one. And if r is infinite order, then you can get new filling every time. And that's how you'll be able to construct infinitely many fillings from, uh, by using cluster theory. Okay, so I think this is all I want to say. Uh, one advertisement, uh, I'm giving a course in the Cluster Algebra Summer School at the University of Connecticut. So if you're interested, uh, you can search Cluster Algebra Summer School 2024 online and, and uh, you should apply. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very nice talk.